Sighing in relief, Adam McGuinness laid the woodcutter's axe down and picked up the split lock halves from where they fell. He slowly meandered over to a large canvas bag he used to ferry firewood and other supplies too large to be contained in his Alice pack back to the abandoned mine in the Rocky Mountains that he now called home. It had been barely over four years ago that his home had been invaded by the Imperium. At the time, he had just left the infantry and returned to his home state of Colorado with his newlywed wife. The initial invasion had been swift and brutal, leaving little in the way of official resistance, be it police, military, or federal agencies. Not that he missed some of those, they had arguably been worse than the new government set up by the Shulvanti in many ways. He shook his head vigorously. It would do him no good to think about those times and how the enemy had hurt him. He stuffed the last of the wood he had gathered and cut into the sack and tightened the drawstring. It was late August, and in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, that could even mean the possibility of light snowfall tonight. Grimacing at the thought, he unslung his AR-338 from his back, laid it against a tree, and picked up his Alice pack. It was far too big for normal everyday use, but his smaller backpack had been caught by a straight blast from a Shulbanti rifle, and was suitably singed to the point of not even being worth repairing. He could go back to the city and look for one, but he was unsettled by the fact that the Shill, or perps as they were known, would find him and tie him to his work with the local militias. As much as the tall, slender, and admittedly gorgeous aliens had done to find and crack down on militias in the area, they usually only could pin down the identities of the leaders, or people remotely connected to them. Which unfortunately meant the only people they could regularly get their hands on were poor saps who were given a rifle and a big speech, before being let loose in the cities as a way to keep them off guard. Unfortunately, this led to a lot of young men with minds filled with vigour and patriotism, being sent off to their deaths or life in prison, with little in the way of training. But that's how all wars went, he supposed, as he walked the mile and a half back to the unintrusive and remarkably well-hidden mine entrance that led into his home. People died, young men got sent to meaningless deaths, and innocents got caught in the crossfire. That's what happened when he went to the army recruiter's office at the age of 17, before he even graduated high school. He managed to secure himself an Option 40 contract with the US Army Infantry, with little understanding of what that meant beyond the basic mechanics of it. He would go through basic training and infantry school, airborne school, and then the Ranger Assessment and Selection Program. And just that he did, despite his grandfather's pleas not to. His grandfather had been a Ranger in Vietnam, and the only thing he had told his family up until that point was that he was in Vietnam. When his grandfather had opened up on him and begged him to renegotiate his contract after sharing the stories of some of the friends he had lost, along with actions he regretted taking, Adam hadn't listened. Now, at the ripe old age of 26, with aching knees and back from dozens of static line jumps and four tours with the regiment, he understood his grandpa's apprehension and wished he listened better. He came home from his fourth tour with a lot of baggage. He had lost the majority of his squad in an ambush in a valley not unlike the one he now called home. It gave him an almost warm sense of nostalgia. The small road running through the middle of it being the only real difference between Karamak and here. He could hear the gunshots from that day his squad had all been but cut down. Wait. He could hear shots. Actual gunfire coming from the road a few hundred yards ahead of him. Dumping the satchel, he pushed up to a vantage point as the heavy rifle fire abated and lied down in the prone, pulling his rucksack off and using it as a rest for his rifle as he scanned the road. Then he found it. A small squad of eight militiamen using a variety of kit and a technical with a M2.50 cal machine gun on the bed had something surrounded. Not just something, but someone. That someone being a shill lying against a tree, one hand pressed to her stomach, and the other trying to draw a pistol from the magnetic clip on her belt. One of the men ran and kicked it from her grip as soon as she had it pulled free. Eh, militia being militia, thought Adam. I wonder if they need any help. No. Not again. Don't get sucked back into that life. Adam chided himself. He really didn't want to fight the shill. Their victory was assured by this point, much to his own human prize dismay. As he refocused on the scope, he saw something that was definitely not okay. One of the soldiers below slapped the alien across her face, and then began to follow her breasts, clearly against her will. Fuck, 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 said Adam, intelligently, as he decided what to do. Then he made his decision, and refocused to the technical, and more specifically to the man on the machine gun. He guessed that the range was about 450 metres away, and while the composite tip rounds that he used would only be able to penetrate Shulvanti out to about 150 metres, at this range they would still zip right through the man's plate carrier. 
He slowly did the mental math for the elevation and gave a quick glance to the trees to confirm windage, cleared the turrets into position, and exhaled a breath. What the hell am I doing? He thought, just before he squeezed off the first round. Meritorious Sergeant Farilla Gresson grimaced. The sad sack of meat in front of her hadn't let up his groping for her armour, which if he wasn't so goddamn ugly and not for the hole in her leg and the side of her gut, might have been a lot more fun. How had it come to this? She pondered, thinking back to how only hours before she and her team had been enjoying some R&R &R in the barracks before being assigned a mission with significantly more haste and less playing than usual. Now she was going to die on some Empress Forsaken world, or because Command had fucked the predictions and planning again. With a chain of command like that, it's no wonder they needed to bring her small team of Death's Head Commandos to this marble of blue and green. Hell, so during the plant of Horny Male Monk, it should have been a damn cakewalk, but no. Apparently they were a greater threat than the Pirates and Alliance Commandos operating on the hellhole her team had been working on before she linked up with them and came here. When she arrived, she thought it was Command throwing her team a bone, and stationing them on the beautiful sex plant without having to give them leave. Now, she could see how wrong she was. The man in front of her stilled as he made a comment back to one of the men behind him, and received an angry response back. He turned to argue in their unusual language, which she was only partly taught during her travel and stationing here. She didn't care at the moment, her blue blood still flowing from her fingers. Her suit automatically tried to tighten and staunch the bleeding, but could only do so much. Fine, the man said, as he turned back to her, and said another few words she couldn't make out with her ears ringing. He turned back to her and leveled his rifle, while she said daggers at him, trying to bore into and explode his head from the inside out with her anger alone. Then something unexpected happened. His head didn't explode, but the man on the heavy machine gun on the truck did not fare so well. A crack sounded through the air as his head ripped itself apart, followed shortly by a resounding boom that echoed around the valley she was currently in. Then the man who had groped her had his chest punched through by another round. By this point, the other men in the pod had recovered from their shock and scrambled for cover, obviously trying to identify where the shooter was. A round ripped through the tree not far from her and took one of the militiamen through the upper middle thigh. Screaming at the top of his lungs, he fumbled around trying to make it to another man at a nearby tree, who had a tourniquet in hand, who was trying to coax the man into crawling to cover with him. No such luck came, as the man with the tourniquet subsequently had the top of his skull taken off by another ear-shattering crack. Normally, the crack of human rifle fire wasn't so loud to her, but she'd had to ditch her helmet after taking a rifle round to the face that fried her comm systems, heads-up display, and even made it to cracking the lens of the eyepieces itself. In doing so, she had also lost contact with her team, separated and alone in their godforsaken valley, after being pursued for miles from their original destination. Humans were made to pursue their prey to exhaustion, which is exactly what happened to her, she summarized. Then she noticed it. All but one of her captors were in various states of wounded, dying or dead, save for one. He rushed forward, sliding behind the engine block of the truck and sped a peek over the edge, only to have a round crack into the engine block a few inches in front of him. Unfortunately, at that angle, the engine block wasn't quite enough to stop the round, or at least his fragments, and shrapnel flew into his face, neck and upper chest. He fell to the ground gurgling and grabbing at his throat and face. She winced, waiting for her own round to hit her. These weren't Shilvanti laser fire. These were distinctly human-made rounds, and flung at a velocity that made her doubt her own suit's integrity. The carnage around her attested to what could happen, especially without her helmet to protect her head, face, and upper neck. But as time dragged on, no shots came. It felt like hours, but in reality it amounted to about ten minutes before a single tall male exited a copse of trees on her right, and began to observe the area. He had on a type of mask the humans called a balaclava, with holes for the eyes and mouth. It was a simple forest green, and helped him, along with his other camouflage gear, blend into the forest like he wasn't even there. She braced for him to kill her too when he lowered his rifle and drew a pistol from the holster on his thigh. Walking up to the gurgling man, he put a single round in his head, and continued on to the man who was quickly bleeding out from the leg wound and asked something in his native tongue. The man spat something back, apparently the wrong thing, and he sighed, pulled his pistol up and put a round for the male skull, confirming that the rest of the insurgents were dead, and making sure for the ones that weren't, he walked over and kneeled in front of her. Hello, he said in shill with a thick American accent. Are you okay? 